here with Senator Padilla of California, and we just concluded a hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee on the Dream and Promise Act, a bill that passed the House of Representatives with bipartisan support. This is an issue I've been working on for 20 years in the Senate. Uh, five different times I brought it to the floor of the Senate for a vote for the DREAM Act, uh, and I was stopped by a filibuster. Only one time that I was able to pass it in the Senate, it could not pass in the House at the same time. We are hopeful that this session of Congress, we can finally bring justice to this issue. We are talking about individuals who were brought to this country as infants, and toddlers, and young people who knew nothing about the family decision and were along for the ride. They lived in America, they went to school in America, they stood up in their classrooms every day, put their hands on their hearts and pledged allegiance to a flag that they believe was their own. And then they came to learn at some point in their life they were undocumented, the papers had not been filed. These are the people we believe deserve a chance to earn their way to legalization and citizenship in the United States. Two of them that came to testify today before the committee are excellent illustrations and examples. Dr. Bonnell Mejia, who is from Chicago, uh, is currently working as an emergency room physician. He is about to complete his residency. This man has literally risked his life every day during this COVID-19 crisis to save others. He is a dreamer. He is undocumented. He is protected only by DACA. And, uh, and Mr. Rene Pontieu, who is a nurse, is uh, with temporary protected status, risking his life in Louisiana at a, at a hospital as well, doing everything he can to save Americans. These are people who want to be part of our future and will be better off if they are. So our purpose today was to have this hearing and hopefully to move a bill, a bipartisan bill, that will finally give the dreamers the justice that they deserve. I was uh, so uh, happy today to have the chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee, uh, Senator Padilla of California, presiding over a major part of this hearing. We've, we're in this together. We hope we can bring justice for the dreamers. Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and as we recognized in committee today, it's uh, the ninth anniversary of the DACA program. Uh, but for Senator Durbin, it's uh, 20 years of fighting for dreamers. And I think uh, uh, the hearing did what we hoped it would do and shed light on the human impact of our immigration system that needs to be fixed. Reform is long overdue, especially for uh, uh, DREAMers, TPS holders, other long-term residents uh, of our country who, despite fear of change in status or deportation, uh, continue to put their lives on the line each and every day to contribute to the resiliency of the nation, uh, to our economy, uh, and even to the supply chain uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, we appreciate uh, their testimony, uh, highlighting their stories uh, to further add to the urgency with which Congress needs to act. Uh, and again, thank you, Senator Durbin. Questions? Senator Durbin, there's approximately 200,000 documented dreamers whose parents came here on visas and they, when they turn 21, they have to self-deport. The Dream and Promise Act doesn't include them. Why is that? I don't know. I'll check and see why that's not included. Senator Durbin. It does include them. Okay, sorry. Those 200,000 are included? Yes. It Senator Durbin, um, the Supreme Court this fall will review a Mississippi law that bans most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Is an unborn baby at 15 weeks a human being? We're on the issue of dreamers and immigration. We'll address the other issues at another what time. Is it? Any other questions? In terms of like the starting point for immigration negotiations of the meetings we both have been taking part of, is it the corn and cinema bill first to address the border, or is it? It's part of it. I, I'm realistic about this. If we're going to have any Republican support, we cannot. Uh, just pass the DREAM Act or pass the Farm Labor Bill, an equally important piece of legislation. We have to take into consideration the current uh, border security challenge that we face. And the good news is I think we're on a positive track. We don't have agreed on everything. There's more to be negotiated. But it is bipartisan, and I'm hopeful that we can include it in any package. I think that's one of the key ingredients to bipartisan support on the floor. I am, August. I am uh, in the anxious class. I want to get this moving. 
We have one week after this left in the month of June, three in July, one in August, and we're gone. We come back in the middle of September with the fiscal year ending October 1st. So I want to get this moving. And I've tried, and Alex has been part of this from the start. We've had these informal meetings, and they're starting to show a little bit of promise, and that, that uh, gives me hope. Any Spanish language press? Okay. Okay. We, I've got to go vote, but I'm going to let you take Uh, sí, bueno, sí, la cuestión es uh, si demócratas están dispuestos en uh, hacer los cambios necesarios para um, uh, responder a la situación en la frontera. Uh, la respuesta es que sí, pero de debe de ser de una manera humana, no cruel, como hemos visto uh, los últimos cuatro años. Uh, pero el ob objetivo de hoy fue de uh, elevar las experiencias de uh, Dreamers uh, y participantes de TPS uh, que han, uh, que merecen la oportunidad de vivir en este país, seguir contribuyendo, trabajando en este país uh, sin temor de deportación uh, y con un camino a la ciudadanía. Su colega Grassley dijo que la legislación en sí no era, no era lo suficiente en su respuesta. ¿eh? Uh, por eso siguen las negociaciones. Muchísimas gracias. Ok, thank you. I think there's a couple of remarks from some of the, some of the um, folks who were invited to speak. But before I get, before I present them, my name is Juan Escalante. I'm also a DACA beneficiary myself. And I have been in this country for the past 20 years. Uh, just like the testimonies that you heard from the witnesses today, from Dr. Bernal and Mr. Pontieu, I have been living in constant fear of the fragility of the DACA program. You see, I started working on immigration-related issues at the age of 17. Back in 2007, I graduated from high school, and I wasn't sure what my future would hold for me. I remember specifically a day where my mother and I sat before an admissions counselor at a, un at a local university, and they explained to us that without the DREAM Act or without reforms to our immigration system, that I wouldn't be able to pay in-state tuition, that instead, I will pay three times that amount. I collected my mother who cried, and I hugged her, not knowing what I would do, but I promised that I would find a way to go to college, graduate, and fulfill her dream of seeing me, the first of three children, graduate from an American university. Fast forward to 2013, I'm a DACA recipient, already holding a bachelor's in political science and going back for my master's degree. In 2015, I graduated with a master's degree in public administration, and now I'm here today at 32 years old, 15 years after my start day as an advocate, to continue what I started, to make sure that bills like the Dream and Promise Act, who have yielded such talent like Dr. Bernal, Mr. Pontio, and so many other people across this country, may comes a reality. There is no, there's no excuse anymore. The time is clear, the time is now. Congress must act on this crucial piece of legislation and develop a pathway to citizenship for hundreds of thousands and millions, hundreds of thousands of dreamers and millions of immigrants across this country. So I wanted to make sure I share those few remarks with you all today. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Pontio, who's one of the expert witnesses at today's hearing. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Wani Pontio. First of all, I would like to thank Dick Durban for the invitation. Uh, I was able to tell my story, and my story is simple. 22 years here in the United States, and I'm a nurse, a registered nurse at Jackson Memorial Hospital, uh, saving lives every day. During COVID-19, I put my life uh, in danger, and my family also, to save American lives. So during this time, while I'm saving lives, I'm worried about uh, the possibility of being deported taking away from my family. And I have my daughter, she's always with me in Washington, D.C., and she's been suffering a lot. Sometimes she cannot sleep. And imagine that you are taking care of people, you are saving lives, but on the other hand, you have the fear of being deported. It's not easy. And I wish that uh, the Senate can step up and pass the 
promise uh, the German promise act so we can have a way to stay in the country to continue to serve to continue to to save lives and my son who is not with me today is Christopher Fontour he's been deployed is a US military and he put his life also on the line to save uh, to protect the country to save other people his life so my daughter is here i would like to introduce her to you she, her name is uh, Christina Puntu. she is a young leader at farm family action network movement in miami she's the co-chair of uh, cifa which is a uh, children for family unification so she wants to say something to to you maybe she's only 14. Hi, uh, my name is Ronnie Christina Ponthew. I am 14 years old. I am the daughter of Ronnie Ponthew. Um, I'm a U.S. born child and I constantly have fears of my parents being deported and I'm not the only one. Out of the 300,000 TBS t recipients, there are children, many U.S. born children like me who are also endangered and scared of the possibility of losing their parents and not being with their parents. Um, I feel for a lot of the DACA recipients who came here when they were very little, who came here not knowing what was going to happen, and now to have not be able to go to college or pursue their careers, it is very hard, and that's why we came here today. My father and many others have testified and gave their testimony to explain how hard it has been uh, being in this country and being in fear of being deported. I thank all the senators who were here who listened and took their time to hear the testimonies and the stories. And I would just like to push the senators to help um, the TPS recipients and the DACA recipients to, to get a permanent solution so that we may be able to stay here and pursue our careers and lives um, for longer. And I'd like to thank you all for your time. And I will now introduce the doctor. Hello, my name is Dr. Manuel Bernal Mejia. I'm currently an emergency medicine physician in Chicago, Illinois. To, beat it, to put it brief, uh, I came here when I was two years old. I've been here for about 27 years in the United States, and the United States is really the only home that I know. Uh, I grew up in Tennessee, where I basically grew up uh, living an average lifestyle, uh, was involved in a lot of extracurriculars, and went on to be successful in college, and you know, DACA really did change a lot for me. DACA opened up a lot of new doors for me, uh, including being able to matriculate into medical school, where I went, up, went on to graduate within the top third of my class. Uh, within a week, I will be finishing my three-year uh, residency training program specializing in emergency medicine, and this is quite the way to <laughs> top that off. Uh, I've been working during the COVID-19 pandemic, and Truthfully, it's been an honor to serve my country in that, in that capacity and, and to use my skill set to save lives and, and provide uh, critical, uh, critically needed skills uh, to help uh, really sick individuals. I do want to thank the senators for who have year after year championed and, and advocated for my community. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank all, all the individuals within my community who have live their lives in fear, but I, I would argue that that fear that we live, uh, live with, the fear of deportation, has only added to our resiliency and has only added to the successes that we have encountered and, and been able to overcome all these barriers that we, that we have been faced with. Uh, thank you very much. Any Spanish language press? Yeah, yeah sure. ¿Qué significaría después de todo esto el, el poder avanzar? Estamos viendo que por primera vez se está escuchando esta legislación en el Senado. ¿Qué significaría después de una lucha tan larga para ti? Bueno, creo que es obvio de que muchas de las personas que han hablado hoy han participado en este país y han calificado sus carreras y sus vidas a través de años. Para mí, obviamente, he vivido en este país ya por 20 años, 15 de los cuales como persona indocumentada, y ver este pedazo de legislación avanzar no solo marcaría el paso adecuado para nuestra comunidad, de 11 millones de, 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 de inmigrantes indocumentados, sino para las personas que se han esforzado, que han ido más allá, las personas que le han dicho que no pueden ir a la escuela, que, que no pueden ir a la escuela porque no tienen un pedazo de papel, pero se han graduado, las personas que quieren ser doctores como el doctor Bernal y que no han logrado, 
Entonces, para mí esto significaría, si llegara a pasar el Dream and Promise Act, no solamente un proyecto de ley, sino un nuevo capítulo en cómo este país trata y reconoce el aporte de los inmigrantes indocumentados e inmigrantes a través de todo este país. La última pregunta, ¿se dieron testimonios sobre criminalidad respecto a inmigrantes? Eh, ustedes obviamente son sujetos a escrutinio cada vez que renuevan. Al escuchar este tipo de testimonios de los mismos senadores, eh, ¿tu respuesta es? Creo que al fin y al cabo lo que sabemos es que cual, la oposición al Dream and Promise Act o cualquier pedazo o proyecto de ley va a ser solamente encontrar excusas. Un caso aislado, trágico, que reconocemos, obviamente escuchamos la historia de una madre que perdió a su hijo y nadie puede regresar a ese ser humano, a esa familia. Y sentimos por esas familias. Pero lo que queremos de que la oposición sepa es de que nosotros no somos esos casos aislados. Somos personas coherentes que de verdad queremos este país. Y lo único que estamos pidiendo y que hemos pedido ya por casi 20 años es solamente una oportunidad para probarlo y demostrarlo. El doctor Bernal, también nos puede decir algo de eso. Doctor Bernal, su respuesta a los republicanos que aún están todavía no están seguros si avanzar con esta legislación o no, ¿qué les dice al respecto? Yo les digo que tengan fe en nosotros. O sea, yo soy un ejemplo, pero hay millones de uh, personas como yo que solo quieren ay ayudar a este país, al país que ellos reconocen como su, su propio país, que quieren tanto, que tienen, quieren ayudar a la comunidad. Uh, yo digo que tengan fe en nosotros y que, uh, que corran el riesgo en nosotros. Y creo que sería algo, algo bueno para este país.